Today we're going to talk about love. <laughs> we have a lot of love here. A lot of love. Title is the greatest of these. We're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians. One that you've probably heard many times, especially uh, at weddings. You hear this a lot, read at weddings. First 13 chapters. Or verses. Not chapters. <laughs> We'll be here for a while if it's 13 chapters. <laughs> if I had the gift of being able to speak in other languages without learning them, and can speak in every language there is in all of heaven and earth, but didn't love others, I would only be making noise. If I had the gift of prophecy and knew all about what is going to happen in the future, knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, what good would it do? Even if I had the gift of faith so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, I would still be worth nothing at all without love. If I gave everything I have to poor people, and if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, but didn't love others, it would be of no value whatever. Love is very patient and kind, never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. It does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, you be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending him. All the special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end, but love goes on forever. Someday prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, these gifts will disappear. Now we know so little even with our special gifts. And the preaching of those most gifted is still so poor. But when we have been made perfect and complete, then the need for these inadequate special gifts will come to an end and they will disappear. It's like this. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child does. But when I became a man, my thoughts grew far beyond those of my childhood, and now I have put away the childish things. In the same way, we can see and understand only a little about God now, as if we were peering at his reflection in a poor mirror. But someday, we are going to see him in his completeness, face to face. Now all that I know is hazy and blurred, but then I will see everything clearly, just as clearly as God sees into my heart right now. And there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. God's holy word to us. Two friends were discussing the possibility of love. I thought I was in love three times, one friend says. How so, his friend asked. He said, well, five years ago, I deeply cared for a woman who wanted nothing to do with me. Was that not love, his friend asks? No, he replies, that was obsession. And then two years ago, I deeply cared for an attractive woman who didn't understand me. Was that not love? No, he replies, that was lust. And last year, I met a woman aboard a cruise ship to the Caribbean. She was smart and funny and a great conversationalist. And everywhere I followed her on that boat, I would get this strange sensation in the pit of my stomach. Was that not love, his friend asked. No, he replies, that was motion sickness. <laughs> We all know what is the greatest thing in the world, don't we? Why, sure. It's being at the Super Bowl with your love of your life feeding you popcorn. That's, 
No. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not the greatest thing in the world. Love, of course, is the greatest thing in the world is. According to God's word, it's even greater than having your loved one beside you, feeding you popcorn anywhere. I'm talking about real love, genuine love, giving love. This is the greatest good in this world. Mary Schwartz, who was an American educator, said, the most important thing in life is to learn how to give out love and to let it come in. This is the idea of learning to love others and be loved by others. And I think this is one of the, one of the things most people want in life, don't we? And if we don't receive love from one person or, or in one area of life, they'll go elsewhere. And this is perhaps maybe one of the reasons why there's so many divorces in America. This also may be one of the reasons why many churches are not growing. How so? Well, if people who visit our churches don't find some love, they may not stick around very long. I remember I wanted to go hear my good friend, Reverend Larson, preach before he retired. So I took a Sunday off and I went down to hear him preach and I certainly uh, was not disappointed in his preaching. It didn't disappoint me. And leaving uh, the church that day, I asked Barb what she thought and she said the sermon was fantastic. But I wouldn't want to go back. So I said, well, what was the problem? She said the church was not very friendly at all. I think two people greeted us the whole day. A lack of loving kindness and loving friendliness will keep many people out of our churches. And this should be a lesson to us all. Anytime we see a new face in church, we need to be quick to introduce ourselves and befriend these people. The greatest of these is what? Faith, hope, what? Love. The greatest of these is defined and explained in our scripture. And I find three things in there that really hit me. The superiority of love, the service of love, and the steadfastness of love. So let's look at them one at a time. The superiority of love. Speaking in the tongues of men could be considered a great feat. Natalie Portman is a Jewish American actress. She was born in 1981 in Israel and she moved together with her parents to the United States. And when she was three years old, Natalie was raised first in Washington, D.C., then they moved to Connecticut before the family moved to New York in 1990. She was always a bright student, straight A's. And in 2003, she graduated from Harvard University with a bachelor degree in psychology. She can speak, are you ready for this? She can speak in English, Hebrew, French, Japanese, German, as well as a little Arabic. Wow, I have trouble with English. <laughs> Natalie Portman's ability to speak in these various languages might wow a lot of people, but there is something better or something greater. And who's one of the greatest speakers ever? Who's one of the greatest preachers ever? Did you ever hear Billy Graham preach in his heyday? His voice, his message, his ability to communicate the gospel message was very hard to beat. In fact, he may well be considered one of the greatest preachers of our time. And in 1949, Billy Graham had a crusade in Los Angeles, California. 
He called it the Greater Los Angeles Billy Graham Crusade, and it was at the Canvas Cathedral with the Steeple of Light. Graham was 30 years old then. They drew 350,000 people over eight weeks to this huge tent at Washington Boulevard and Hill Street. And about 3,000 non-believers committed their lives to Christ. And as great a preacher and speaker as Billy Graham was, there is something greater. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. So no matter how many different languages a person can speak or know, and no matter how well a person can speak, if that person doesn't speak from the heart of love, then they're just making a bunch of noise. A heart of love is greater than great speaking ability. Have you, have you ever listened to one of those prophecy preachers on television? I mean, they talk about things that are going to happen in this world and in America before the end of time. And it's like they have this, this special insight in regard to what's going to happen on the last days. Well, guess what? Guess what? I know too. And you can too. It's in the book. Let's see here. Matthew 24, 4 to 8. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Times are getting tough. And they may get a lot tougher. But in the end, we win. Isn't that great? We win. And there's nothing. Absolutely. And there's something better than being a prophet. If I had the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I had a faith that could move mountains, but have not, I am nothing. So, beloved, love, you see, is superior to all other gifts that any person could have. Second, the service of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. So if love is patient and it's kind and it's not rude and it's not selfish and not proud to me, this says that real love is a servant to others. Love thinks of others and serves others. Oh, a great story about a mild-mannered man. He was tired of being bossed around by his wife. Now, let's don't get too excited in here. <laughs> so he went to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said he needed to build his self-esteem. 
And so he gave him a book on assertiveness, which he read on the way home. He had finished the book by the time he reached the house, and the man stormed into the house, walked up to his wife, pointing a finger in her face. From now on, I want you to know I am the man of this house. And my word is law. I want you to prepare me a gourmet meal tonight. And when I'm finished eating that meal, I expect a delicious dessert afterwards. Then after dinner, you're going to draw my bath so I can relax. And when I'm finished with my bath, guess who's going to dress me and comb my hair? The funeral director, she said. <laughs> Ladies, can I get an amen out of it? <laughs> Rebecca, age eight, said when my grandma got arthritis, she, could, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandpa does it for her now. All the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. Now, that's love. Newspaper columnist and minister George Crane tells of a wife who came to his office full of hatred toward her husband. I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has hurt me. So Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. He says, why don't you go home? And act as if you really love your husband. I mean, tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be kind and considerate and generous as possible. I mean, spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. And after you've convinced of your undying love and that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. Well, with revenge in her eyes, she smiled and she exclaimed, beautiful, beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? And she did it with enthusiasm acting as if. And for two months, she showered him with love and kindness and listening and giving and reinforcing and sharing. And when she didn't return, Crane called. He says, are you ready now to go through with the divorce? Divorce, she exclaimed, never. I discovered I do love him. In his book on mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to loving. Perhaps if we all try more kindness in dealing with others, and not just at home. Perhaps we would find more love for others. Love is kindness. It's a matter of serving others. And then third and finally is the steadfast of love. You know, when I was young, I loved sports. Sports was, was my life as a kid. And my favorite sport when I was growing up was baseball. I loved baseball. So I got into Little League, and of course, when I was playing Little League ball, the best nine players played. It's not everybody gets in the game, everybody gets the bat. Your first two years of Little League, you're taking splinters off your hiney, because that's where you've been sitting for two years, unless you got out and played and tried to get better. 
I remember I was umpiring a little league game, and after the game was over, this kid went up to his coach and said, Coach, can I put my glove in the, in the bag here? And the coach said, why? He said, well, I don't want to forget it at home. Well, they didn't have another game for another week. So that whole week, he's not practicing. He don't care. He's going to get in the game. Doesn't make a difference. But when I was a kid, the best nine played. We went to Little League. From there, I went to Senior Little League. And then I went to uh, college and played uh, baseball in college. I was the president of an of a independent baseball league for many years. High school, I played baseball, but I also was in football. I was a kicker. I was a place kicker in football. And then, of course, as I got older, I played golf. But then, we, who's laughing about that? <laughs> Some Weisenheimers in this place, I'm telling you. But after baseball, I didn't want to quit baseball, so, of course, what's next is slow-pitch softball. So I got in a softball league, and I got in one league that for over five years, we played double headers every Sunday, two o'clock in the afternoon in June, July, and August, when it's about 180 degrees. But what I want you to understand is when I played baseball, when I played softball, I played like my hero was Pete Rose. And I hustled everywhere. I slid head first. I did everything. My uniform was always the dirtiest one on the team. I played so hard. Then what happened was on Monday mornings, I had a hard time getting out of bed. Then the second year, it was Tuesday mornings. I still had art. <laughs> and in my fifth year, it was around Friday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I finally started to get better, and we started all over again on Sunday. So you say, well, what's the deal? Well, the deal is, is that same thing's happening to you. We're all failing. We're all wearing out. But there is something that never fails and never wears out, and that's love. Love never fails. That means it's steadfast, it's steady, it's lasting, it's continual, it's never ending, perhaps even eternal. And when we get something we like, we hope that it's always going to work. It's always going to be there. It's always going to last. But if it's physical or if it's material, it won't last. As much as we want it to, it won't last. A stingy old lawyer who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness was determined to prove wrong the saying, you can't take it with you. So after much thought and consideration, the old man finally figured out how to take at least some of his money with him when he died. So he instructed his wife to go to the bank, withdraw some money to fill up two pillowcases. And then he directed her to take the bags of money up into the attic directly above his head while he was in bed. His plan was when he passed away, he would reach out and grab the bags on the way to heaven. <laughs> mm -hmm. Several weeks after the funeral, the deceased lawyer's wife was up in the attic cleaning and she came upon the two forgotten pillowcases stuffed with cash. <laughs> so she said, oh, that old fool. I knew he should have had me put that money in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> As we all know, we can't take it with you no matter which way you're going. Money and material things will not last into eternity. So now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Faith is wonderful. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 
And hope is wonderful because without hope of eternal life, how miserable life would be. Life is tough, but hope of a better life keeps us going. But the greatest of these is love. Finally, a long time ago, a little five-year-old boy, he lived in an, in, a, in an orphanage and he had this terrible, terrible habit of stealing from the other children. And the superintendent of the orphanage tried talking to the boy, but it didn't work. He just kept stealing. The superintendent tried all kinds of discipline, but nothing seemed to work. Well, finally someone suggested, let's, let's lavish love on him. And in different ways, the people who worked in that orphanage began to show love to that boy. They began to show interest. They listened to him, to play with him, to hug him. And suddenly, for no apparent reason, the boy stopped stealing. Love never fails. Love is greater than faith and hope. Why? Because God is love. And God wants us to see him and know him and to become like him. So yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Always remember, the greatest of these is love. Amen.